Hello. So, welcome to this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, we're here to talk about an exciting new postdoctoral fellowship program. Uh, so, before I get started, I want to tell you we have uh, coffee and water in the back. We have name tags that a few of you picked up when we were coming in. Um, and the reason I'm even asking about name tags is because uh, what we found, we so this is the second town hall we're doing, we did one this morning. Uh, it was just useful at the end of the session where people were trying to find partners and so on. So anyway, uh, feel free to get up, grab a coffee, get a name tag. Um, we have a bunch of things that we'll go through um, and, and then we'll take uh, questions and then we'll have a little bit of networking time. That's, that's sort of the agenda for, for this afternoon. So <coughs> um, background is uh, we've, we've got a gift from a donor who wishes to remain anonymous for now. And so we're not naming that, but this is this is a, uh, a philanthropic gift from a donor who is committed to, is, is really excited about how AI can transform the pursuit of science and engineering and would like to make a difference in terms of doing this. So uh, this is a campus-wide training program. We'll say more about the specific fields and so on. Uh, and it's very large. Uh, it's, it's 110 postdoc years of funding, so over six years. So uh, six years of pro, uh, nominally 10 new postdocs each year, assuming two-year appointments. <coughs> um, the other key thing about this is this is not a way of you know, this is not going to be 60 postdocs spread throughout the university, each doing whatever each of you is already doing. Uh, the point is to try to create a community with these postdocs, with mutual learning and, uh, and advocacy uh, that hopefully you will find a positive influence on your own labs and your own work. Um, and uh, right now, uh, the the name for the program is is AI at Michigan or AIM, uh, but that's a temporary name. Uh, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. So, <coughs> the donor's been very clear about what is in scope and what is not. And uh, this, this is what uh, is their definition. So AI is very broadly defined. And they included these four terms to point out things that we may not think of AI as AI. You know, simulations are usually not things one would consider AI, right? On the other hand, when they say things like simulation or Bayesian inference or whatever, they are not, they're also very clear that sort of uh, old technologies for doing these things are not in scope. So finite element models for simulation are not very interesting from an AI perspective. But if you're creating, you know, an AI-based model that you use to simulate some system, um, you know, because you're using AI to predict the next consequences of some actions or whatever, um, that kind of thing would be in scope. Um, the scientific domain is uh, mathematical, physical, earth and environmental sciences, basic biological sciences explicitly in excluding medicine and biomedical sciences. Um, and 
engineering. Uh, social sciences are also ex explicitly excluded. Um, and in terms of uh, what will be funded with these things is very much the use of AI to advance investigations in these domain disciplines. And if doing so requires advancing AI methodology, that is really a good thing. Okay, but pure AI advances are not in scope. Okay, it has to be AI advances coupled with some domain. Um, also, since AI is largely uh, part of computer science, and they're very s keen on having interdisciplinary collaborations, uh, computer science itself is not uh, an acceptable scientific domain. In other words, you can't engineer a better computer uh, using AI. Okay. Um, so I'm Jag, Jagadish. I'm, the, I'm a professor of computer science and the director of Midas. And uh, I'm partnering with uh, Bill Curry, uh, who's a professor and associate dean for research at the School of Environmental uh, Environment and Sustainability, um, and uh, uh, Jing Liu, who's um, uh, managing director of uh, Midas and uh, a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, so, and and they'll you'll be hearing from them in a few minutes. Um, we have uh, a distinguished advisory committee helping us uh, make our decisions and shape our program. Um, we have a curriculum committee uh, whose efforts we want to recognize uh, because there's a lot of work in terms of the programming that we are trying to do centrally for this large cohort of postdoctoral scholars. And we'll tell you a little bit about that too. Um, and in terms of the timing, uh, the, the key thing that we, we want you to know is the donor doesn't want to wait till next year. Okay, so typically we'll have cohorts starting in the fall, you know, nominally September 1st. However, this year we will have a cohort, even though we're already into October, right? Um, and we'll go through the, the expected schedule for that in a minute. Um, so future years, uh, It'll be some kind of, you know, December, January type deadline for appointment the following, you know, a few months later, starting in September. This year, uh, our deadline's a month from now for an appointment to begin by the end of the year. Okay, and I'm gonna ask uh, Jing to come up and uh, take it from here. So I'm going to take over from here and talk more about the program structure. So because this is a highly interdisciplinary program, we explicitly require that each mentor, uh, each uh, postdoc will need to have two faculty mentors. Uh, one of them is a science mentor and one of them is an AI mentor. Um, I want to explain the, uh, you know, a little bit further in that the ultimate goal is really to make sure that the postdoc is well mentored, both for the scientific research and for skill building in AI. 
So this is why we require the two mentor model. But um, who is a science mentor? Who is an AI mentor? There is there is a, a lot of flexibility. In some cases, it's really easy to tell that one person has a lot of scientific expertise and another is an AI expert. In some cases, it could be both mentors are equally good at science or and AI, right? In those cases, who is the science mentor, who is the uh, AI mentor, will be determined by the mentors themselves and the postdocs. We just want to make sure the training needs are well covered, okay? And uh, mentor eligibility, full-time faculty members at any of the three campuses um, on either the instructional tra track or the research track. So um, some of you, I, we actually got this question from a few people at our first town hall today, which was, well, where do I find an AI mentor to co-mentor a fellow? Uh, we definitely are willing to help. However, if you go to our website, uh, the program website, which I think will be shown at the end of the presentation, but you can also just uh, go to Midas website and navigate there. Um, there is an FAQ page. And if you click that F FAQ page, there is a list of faculty members who have already expressed interest to be AI mentors. And there are 60 of them. So <laughs> you can also go through that list and see if you want to reach out to anyone. Okay. So, yeah, so the, um, the program will pay for a competitive salary and benefits for the fellows. And we will also have some supplemental funding for the fellows to go to short courses, you know, workshops as, at conferences and so forth for AI training. Um, we do ask that the faculty mentors together pay for research resources, you know, space, lab equipment, if there's, you know, wet experiments involved, right, uh, computers, computing cost, data storage, and those kind of things. Um, publication cost, if any, and also we ask that the mentors support each fellow to go to two conferences each year. For especially expensive conferences, there will be supplemental funding from the program. Um, so the funder actually is very keen to organize um, events that uh, that really kind of help build uh, uh, collaboration between uh, fellows and mentors at all the universities funded through the same program. So when these events happen, expenses will be paid. Okay, so another formal structure that we're, go we're going to build into the program is the fellowship committee. And it's really, it's similar in essence as you know, PhD thesis committee. Um, the committee will have the two mentors, the program directors, and another faculty collaborator, and will meet every six months. So if the fellow stays in the program for two years, there'll be four uh, fellowship committee meetings. And it's really about providing additional support, mentoring, uh, and looking for opportunities, and making sure things are on the right track. Okay, so um, this individualized development plan or IDP is going to be a central part of both the application and also the training uh, thereafter. And this is because the fellows in this program will likely come from very diverse backgrounds in terms of the, their training, in terms of the scientific domains that they're, they're going to work in. Also, they will have diverse needs in the kind of AI skills that they need to they need to build based on their background again and based on the research question. And so, um, but in the end, all of them will need to reach a fairly um, reasonable level of competency, right? So that's why an IDP is much better than if we require them to take a course or do something like this. So, so the initial draft of the IDP should be included in the application but with the help of mentors and the, the fellowship committee, it'll be updated uh, along the way. And I want to 
make sure to mention here that we're not looking for a formula. We're looking for approaches that are feasible and necessary. Uh, so for example, we don't require fellows to take a class, even though you, they, they can propose to do that if they think that's the best way that they train, right? But it's really about, do you know your training needs and do you come up with a plan to meet that need? Okay, um, starting with how to build AI skills, but later on, um, there will be other components such as you know how you develop your teaching skills, your communication skills, and how you put them as part of your plan, right? That can come later. Um, also want to echo what Jack just said about um, this is going to be a real com learning community. This is not 60 postdocs dispersed on campus, right? So for that reason, we will provide space for the postdocs to work um, centrally as a group. So they will be required to work uh, more than 50% of time at the central location. And then the rest of time, they'll be with their mentors groups. Okay, so again, for building a real learning community, we will offer a number of, actually will require the participation of a number of collaborative, uh, collaborative learning activities. I just wanna go through these very briefly. Weekly research meetings, this is, these are the meetings where the fellows will discuss their research projects, do journal club, uh, maybe practice you know, their talks at conferences and so forth. Um, weekly theme-based uh, AI carpentry, we will ask the fellows to group themselves based on the methodology they use, the research questions that they wanna address and so forth into a few smaller groups. And these, uh, each of these AI carpentry will work together uh, at the same time, once a week. So they will show up at Midas Space together. And so, and we will ask faculty mentors to take turns attending as well so that the group really can work together and um, mentor each other. Um, there will be an annual week-long boot camp at the beginning of each cohort's uh, onboarding. This will be a week where they meet each other, they talk with all the mentors, uh, present their research, uh, you know, talk with invited speakers, and maybe also have AI tutorials and so forth. It's really gonna be an intensive week. Um, hackathons, so I want to, uh, uh, so I want to actually mention here that um, some of these ideas actually came from our own postdoc fellows. Um, so I will talk about our own uh, program in a minute, but the hackathon is gonna be a few times, three, four times a year, where all the fellows get together for two days and work on uh, one of the research questions posed by the faculty mentors. Uh, the, you know, the, the fellows will vote on which idea they, they work on, but the, the idea here is that we wanna, uh, as a group, we we'll wanna teach the fellows how to take a very ambitious idea, right? Because the, really the essence of the program is to enable groundbreaking research. So how do you take uh, you know, a very ambitious idea and turn that into a feasible first step of a project? And, and through this, right, again, build more understanding of where those groundbreaking ideas come from. Um, we will also ask the fellows to together develop one workshop each semester, it's a one day thing, for the campus, teaching AI skills, AI in science and engineering skills for the broader campus. This is beyond having a core group of fellows. This is how do you use this core group to really build a broader community for AI in science and engineering research on campus. And the next thing is, the fellows will also organize an annual AI in science and engineering symposium. Um, so guided by the mentors, therefore we also, uh, in a second, we'll, we'll talk about expectations. Um, so beyond U of M, this is one of the nine um, sites around the world that this funder is funding to start the same uh, postdoc programs. 
So we can't announce the names yet, as Jack mentioned. Uh, but there will be uh, activities across all nine sites. Okay, expectations. Um, you know, main expectations really, you know, do your research well and uh, be well trained in AI methods, right? But uh, beyond these, uh, actively participate in the uh, collaborative learning activities uh, for bo both fellows and mentors so that they help us build a true community on campus and also uh, enable the use of AI methods in science and engineering more broadly on campus. This really is basically what it is. And then uh, obviously for the um, mentors, they need to commit to the actual, actually providing the adequate resources and mentoring to the fellows. Um, more specifically, uh, mentors, for example, um, they will be review. They will be helping us to review future applications. Um, Jack mentioned the curriculum committee. That committee is going to be really important because what they develop, they are already working on this, developing an in initial set of materials and resources, and these can be incorporated into the individualized development plans. So in the in the future, right, we will we might invite some mentors to also join the committee and contribute that way. Okay, uh, this is what I'm, uh, I was talking about. Uh, we're not building this program in thin air. We already have a Michigan Data Science Postdoctoral Fellows Program, and we've been running that program for three years now. So some of the components of the new program is actually based on our experience with this program. Some of the components were actually recommended to us by the postdocs in the data science postdoc program. And the data science pro pro program will not stop. So it will still exist, right? So this, this so our old pro program and the new AI in science program will complement each other. Um, so we will support the postdoc fellows for a diverse range of career outcomes. So um, many of them will end up in academia being faculty members, but um, there will be other but you know, all options are open to them. For our current postdoc program, I just wanna mention that half the people ended up being faculty members at various universities, and you can see some examples here. Um, about a quarter ended up being uh, data scientists in industry, and about a quarter ended up being scientists in national labs. Um, so, okay, so, here, I just want to mention that um, we, will look, uh, we will look for ways to build collaboration between this postdoc program and other training programs on campus, other postdoc training programs, and other training programs that also focus on data and AI and scientific discovery. So uh, Karthik Duraisaki, who is the incoming director for MICDE, the Michigan Institute for Computational Discovery and Engineering, he was going to be here to talk about their training programs, but actually he can't make it. So I just want to mention very briefly, you guys probably know about MICDE. Uh, it's an organization under the Office of Research, the Vice President for Research. Um, and the really, as you say here, right, it's uh, about computational science um, and uh, very multidisciplinary. Um, they are, I'm going to skip that because I don't know a whole lot about what to say there. Uh, but they have a number of educational programs, uh, PhD in scientific computing. They also have a certificate program in uh, scientific computing, a t uh, actual PhD degree, and also graduate certificate in computing. So this is the kind of example of programs that we will be working with. Um, and so if you guys, if certain programs come to mind, if there are certain pro programs that you're involved in, right, and thinking about, okay, we need to build synergy, do let us know. Now I'm gonna pass the mic to Bill, who's gonna talk about the important application process. 
Hi folks, I'm Bill Curry, I'm a professor in CS, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the application process. Um, first, just wanted to point out, um, we have coffee in the back. If you haven't seen it, feel free to get up and uh, refill. Um, also, just to learn a little bit about you, how many people are currently postdocs? All right, welcome. How about PhD students who are thinking about being a postdoc? Um, all right, welcome. Um, so the application timeline, as Jag mentioned, this is a six-year program that's going to have 10 cohorts, 10 postdocs per year in cohorts. Um, the normal application process going forward is going to be the applications due in January for the following September, right? But the sponsor wanted the first set of 10, 10 postdocs, the first cohort, essentially immediately. So we have this, this very compressed um, application process for the first cohort, for what we're calling the 2022 cohort. Applications are due November 7th this year. That's about four weeks from now. We realize that's really short, but this comes from the sponsor. They wanna, they wanna ramp this up very quickly across all nine universities. They're gonna be making a public announcement by the end of October. Um, so we can't, we can't say who the sponsor is or what the other universities are until they make their public announcement, but we need to get this, uh, this application process started. Applicants will have, um, will make offers by December 2nd and you'll have one week to accept the offer. We recognize this is really, really short, but this is just for the first cohort. After that, there'll be much more time. You have to have a PhD degree in hand by the time you start, uh, by the time the start date of the program. It can be in any field. The scientific scope that Jag talked about is the topic you're going to address as part of this program, not the topic area that your PhD was in or, that, or the department or topic area that the mentors are in. You can already have had postdoc positions, but not a faculty appointment. Um, international students are welcome. And the ideal candidate's gonna have some training both in AI and a domain discipline, but recognizing that's likely to be asymmetrical, it's probably gonna be a lot more training in AI and you're interested in applying that in a domain through, throughout your career, or you have your domain scientist and you wanna learn more AI so you can apply that in your domain throughout your career. UM internal candidates are eligible, they'll always be eligible, but in this first year we're anticipating it's probably gonna be mostly UM internal candidates. We're welcome to consider candidates from outside, but given the, the really short um, fuse here, and by the way, thank you all for, for coming to this with like four days notice. <laughs> we recognize that was a really short fuse as well. The ideal program, think of it as um, the ideal applicant, it's the fellow, the topic, and the two mentors, the AI methodology mentor and the science domain mentor, this, that set of four things. The ideal is that uh, that's a completely new grouping. Um, the topic is very innovative, very transformational. We're really looking for ideas that are, that are gonna catalyze breakthroughs in different fields of science. The sponsor believes that AI has made incredible advances, but it has not penetrated other fields of science. They wanna light a fire under applying AI in science at these nine universities. So we're really looking for bold, transformative ideas. Recognizing, however, with this first cohort, it's likely gonna be people who are already at Michigan and it may be an extension on what you're already doing, right? Um, one of the two mentors may be somebody you're already working with, uh, which is fine, but we'd like you at least to have that second mentor be somebody new. Um, that you're not already working with. So the application is really um, up to the, the prospective fellow, the postdoc to, to do, okay? But you're gonna wanna work with the two mentors as part of it, and you can certainly review it with them and have them help you um, in the application. One approach would be to secure one mentor and then with the help of that person, look for the second mentor and, and we can help. As Jing said, uh, if you go to the website, for the program, the FAQ um, lists about 60 people who are AI methodologists who have already said they're interested, but, but of course we wanna encourage you to um, be broader than that if you like, any faculty member. And then the applicant um, submits the application. It includes your CV, a two-page research statement, 
with a compelling vision and a plausible approach. Um, we thought two pages was a good compromise between broad thinking and, and detail. We don't, don't be too worried about getting into all the steps and all the detailed methodology. Uh, we assume that some of that is gonna be developed along the way. You're gonna have this um, fellowship committee of six people that's gonna help you develop the methodology and the applications along the way. Um, think of it as a very high level compelling vision, but you wanna convince the reviewers of the feasibility of achieving that vision during the two year postdoc and how that's gonna catalyze your career and help you um, build your career. That leads to the individualized development plan. Um, talk about the training needs of the applicant and how uh, the two mentors are committed to helping to meet those training needs. Um, and again, recognizing this is gonna be revised several times, probably over the two-year program. It's just an initial plan for training. We just wanna see that it's, it's been thought through what training is needed um, for the specific topic, the specific person. We wanna see a half-page responsible AI statement. Really just, um, there's no right or wrong answer here. <laughs> just, um, Tell us what you're thinking about responsible AI, what that means to you, uh, and maybe how that relates to your work. Um, the idea is that any application of AI should be thinking about uh, the responsible use of that application. And then a half page DEI statement. You can talk about um, how your life experiences or past activities, current activities or future planned activities are gonna contribute to DEI uh, in the program and at the University of Michigan. The mentors' letters of support, you need one of these from each of the two mentors. These are not reference letters, okay? Uh, like if someone's applying for a faculty position and you're just writing them a reference letter. This is the mentor writing about how this work is gonna transform the field, how this work is gonna contribute to what you're doing in your lab. Um, and we wanna hear a commitment that you're gonna mentor, or you're gonna stick with this person through the two-year program. Um, and that you're gonna be available to help with the hackathons and the symposiums and, and the kinds of expectations, the uh, providing funding for travel to conferences and so on um, that you've heard about. And then two to three additional recommendation letters that are just ordinary types of recommendation letters from other faculty. With that, I'm gonna turn it back to Jag. He's gonna talk about uh, a little bit more about the suction criteria, um, and then we'll open it up for questions, and after that, we'll have a networking opportunity. Yeah. Go ahead. Are there applications that go through the online because of the Yes. 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 So actually let's go forward a couple of slides. Uh, we have a website up um, and this slide deck is not yet on the website but will be. There is a FAC on the website with actually more detail than in the slide deck. Um, and if things go well, uh, this meeting is being recorded and and there should be a recording on the website as well. I will also add about the FAC download. You will only be able to access it for now if you use your umich.edu email address. So please do that. So before we go in for more questions, I just wanted to kind of try to wrap things up. Bill talked about, Bill Curry talked about a number of things that need to go in the application package. It's, uh, it's not a standard, you know, here I am, this is my CV type of an application. Um, there's a significant mentor role in fact, both mentors' role. And it's, we want the package as a package and the, app, the, the prospective fellow and the two mentors will have formed a team prior to the submission of the package and it doesn't matter who initiated which thing there. You know, sometimes a mentor may find a prospective fellow and help find another mentor you know, sometimes a prospective fellow may drive this and try to locate people, you know, whatever, whichever direction it all goes, eventually it's a package. 
Uh, in terms of, since it's complicated, uh, we've, I thought it'd be useful just to reprise the selection criteria. And this is roughly in order of importance. Uh, you know, the program area is kind of a yes, no thing. If it's not in, it's not in. Um, but then uh, the research plan is really very important, is really the main takeaway from here. Um, not in the sense of a proposal. So it's only two pages, so it's not, it's not a well-developed, here is exactly what I'm going to do, and here are all the ways things can go wrong, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. But more, is it a compelling vision for how the youth, how AI can transform the way that some, some scientific question is being addressed? And, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of the impact and, and so on. And is this a novel use, novel way of doing things, right? Uh, does it seem, basically, if it seems plausible, we're not going to, in two pages, you're not going to be describing enough that we are going to be evaluating it as a proposal. We're not going to be saying, uh, you know, is your approach good enough, right? That kind of stuff, right? Um, then, of course, we look at candidate qualifications and note that uh, the learning plan is something that we will uh, also look at even though this is likely to evolve. So it's not so much what's in the learning plan or the, or the quote, quality of the plan as much as evidence that there has been some thought about, here's what I know, here's what more I need to learn to be successful, right? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's what a thoughtful learning plan would say. Um, and then uh, the mentors matter uh, in terms of uh, the application success. Uh, when I say expertise, it's not so much a question of uh, the mentor's accomplishments as a mentor's area of expertise. Um, you know, do the, do the two mentors together cover appropriate uh, parts of the sub-disciplines that, that are required for the, for the intended plan, you know, that kind of thing. And of course, uh, the mentor's commitment. Um, and then, um, you know, diversity is, is uh, really important. And in addition to demographic diversity, which we will be paying attention to, so, so the previous slide was more kind of individual package, and, and this slide is more the cohort as a whole type of questions. Um, there, there's one that we probably won't do much with on the very first cohort, but it's, it, it is a dimension, is, is diversity of PhD granting institution. It, um, and, um, uh, you know, we're trying, trying our best to be equitable in terms of how we run things and uh, we're doing a number of things in terms of our process with respect to that. So I think, I think that this is, this is it. I think I already showed you the slide. So with that, I'm going to stop.